Welcome to Silicon Mountain Train. Today we're going to show you what Windows 95 can do. You might as well throw away all those confusing manuals that come with this program because this video will explain the differences in previous Windows programs compared to this new version and also provide a base of knowledge to help you run this program. If you're new to Windows, don't worry. We will help you understand this program. For those who already have Windows experience, this video will show you the improved user-friendly interface and demonstrate the power of a 32-bit multitasking environment. You will also learn tricks and tips to improve your computer's efficiency, sharpen user skills, and see the benefit of the plug-and-play functions. Windows 95 Installation From DOS or Windows, start up the Setup program on the Windows 95 Setup Disks or CD-ROM. Setup will run ScanDisk, which will correct any data storage problems on your hard drive. This is a function built in the Windows 95 to optimize your computer's abilities. Select OK to start the scan disk, and after it has been completed, a scan of your hard disk drive, the Windows 95 program will copy the necessary files to get information it needs to run your computer. Setup will then ready the Setup Wizard, which is a utility that simplifies the setup process and eliminates some tedious procedures. Next, choose where you want to install Windows 95. By the default process, C colon backslash Windows will be selected, since this is the common PC procedure. Choose Next. Setup prepares the desired directory and also checks for available hard drive space. If it finds there's not enough space, then it will recommend Setup Options. If Setup determines that there is enough hard drive space, it will go to the Setup Options screen. You are presented with four options and may choose one of them. Typical, the most common and the default selection, will install the standard amount of utilities and programs needed to run Windows 95. Laptop is used to run its namesake and is useful for people on the go. Minimal is for those who don't have enough free hard disk space or for those that just want to install the basics that will operate Windows 95. Custom is the fourth and final choice. Only use this if you're accustomed to Windows. This gives you the control of what you will use and discard extras that are not needed. This option is only for the advanced Windows user. Choose the setup option you want, then click Next. Setup will analyze your computer for hard drive installed. Be patient because this process might take a while. After identifying all the hardware and making notes of your previous selections, Setup will install the program on your hard drive. When this is finished, Setup will restart your computer and will open Windows 95 while continuing to update files. There are many ways to set up Windows 95 and each configuration and finalization will be different. Simply follow the steps and the program will do the rest. Changing from Windows 3.1 and DOS to Windows 95. The people who will have the hardest time using Windows 95 are the experienced Windows and DOS users. It will require a slightly different mindset than most software that Windows and DOS users are accustomed to, and the transition from Windows 3.1 and DOS is not complicated, just tedious. From the new shell to the absence of DOS, Windows 95 is completely different. This may scare some faithful users into not updating into the new operating system, but there's no need to worry. We will discuss the basics, plus a little more to get you started. Anything we will not discuss can be found with online help, accompanied with Windows 95. Some things are too easy. The components of a window are pretty much the same as in other Windows versions. There is a Control Menu, Minimize button, Maximize button, Close button, Title bar, and a Menu bar. These are still the same components, but with just a little different look. You may also notice that the key commands aren't listed in the menus like they used to be. But if you're one of those who must use them, don't worry, it still works. There are underlined letters in menus that are shortcuts. You can use these shortcuts by pressing Alt and then the underlined letter at the same time. If you don't like a lot of windows open at the same time, you can change it so that every time you open a new folder, the contents of it will replace what's in the currently open window. There are several reasons why Windows 95 is different from other versions of Windows. One is that Windows 95 uses a 32-bit program, which means that it has better graphics, runs faster, and it is multitasking. This means that you can run several programs at once without worrying about your system crashing. Windows 95 doesn't use a program or a file manager. Now those programs are combined in one area called My Computer. Remember how difficult it was in the early versions of Windows to come up with a creative eight-letter file name? It was hard to remember what it meant to recover your data. What about that three-letter extension? Well, no more of that. Now you can have a file name up to 255 characters in length, and you can use spaces and punctuation. That makes it easier to remember. 
But you can only do this if you have software that has the Design for Windows 95 logo. If you don't, then you must still use the eight-letter file name plus the three-letter extension. Windows 95 boasts a friendly interface which makes it easier to use. The primary design goal of this program was to make it easy for new users. It is designed to minimize the number of clicks to perform various tasks, which speed up the operator's work. It only takes a single click to initiate. There is no need to hold down the mouse button while moving the pointer over to the selected area. Click once on the Start button and move the mouse pointer over a group, and if there is a drop-down menu for that selection, it will pop up. When you obtain the program you want, it only takes one more click to select your choice, and that's how simple it is. When Windows 95 is started up, you'll see what's referred to as your desktop. This is intended to simulate a real desktop, and it is object-oriented. It allows you to put things where you want them. On your desktop, there's an icon titled My Computer, and to see what it contains, double-click on the icon. You will see that this contains a list of all the utilities on your PC. It lists all drives, the control panel, and printers. It uses folders for subdirectories and icons for programs and documents. There is a recycle bin that is also on your desktop. This is your trash and is where all of your deleted files go. It's nice because the files are not erased until you empty the recycle bin. So if you put something in there by accident, you can still save it before you empty your trash. To do this, double click the recycle bin icon. Drag the item that you want to save either onto the desktop or to the directory that you want it in. Windows 95 is a document-oriented program, and it is not application-oriented like other versions of Windows. It lets you begin creating a document without choosing an application. To open a document, click the right mouse button while the pointer is over the desktop. Choose New. Then, from the drop-down menu, select Microsoft Word 6.0 Document, or another kind of document. Your choices may be different depending on the software that is in your computer. After doing this, an icon will appear on your desktop. Double-click on it to begin typing and editing. There are three main areas that you need to know to be able to use Windows 95 successfully. They are the Taskbar, the Explorer, and the Control Panel. The first area we'll discuss will be the Taskbar, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. It is always on top by default. This makes multitasking capabilities easily accessible. This tool is used to start up an application or jog between applications that are currently open. Each time a new application is started or a new window is open, a command button for that window is shown on the taskbar. You can customize the taskbar to fit your needs. You can move it to any edge of the screen by dragging it there like this. Or you can make it have room for two rows of buttons like this. Click on the top edge and expand the size just enough to fit the two rows of buttons. This is useful if you are running several programs at the same time because it's easier for you to read the button functions. On the taskbar, you will find the Start menu. The Settings menu provides quick access to taskbar's own properties. You can hide it and have it pop up only when the mouse pointer is over that area or when Control and Escape keys are pressed together. You can also choose whether or not to show the clock and change the time of the clock. Just double-click it. You have the choice to display small or large icons in the Start menu. You can also remove a file from the Start menu and still have it saved on the hard drive, or you can add a shortcut to the Start menu by choosing Add. Type in a name or click and browse to find the file you want. Click Next. Select the folder to place it in. Click Next again. Then select a name for the shortcut. Click Next. Choose an icon. Then click Finish. You can also drag these programs to the Start menu. The Documents menu shows the last 15 documents you had open. This allows easy access to them. A document can be represented by any file, and you can clear these items from the Document menu if you'd like to. The Settings menu provides quick access to control panel programs, which provides a list of all the program groups, printers, and fonts. It also allows you to access the taskbar's own properties. The Find menu will search disk drives for a particular file or folder. It can search by name or partial name, extension of files, time and date last modified, size, or even text in the document such as a word, phrase, or expression. This makes it much easier to find data. Help Topics is basically the same as in any other Windows versions. 
With help in Windows 95, the search and index are combined into one function. You can either scroll through an alphabetical list or type in the topic of your search. The help feature in Windows 95 contains hypertext links and jump buttons that will help take you there directly. This makes getting on different topics much easier. The Run menu allows you to activate programs directly without an installed icon. Shutdown is the same thing as turning off your computer. There is no more exit windows because you no longer exit to DOS, and that's why Shutdown was created. You must click on it before turning your computer off, otherwise files and temporary files created may be lost, which is bad for your computer. When you click on Shutdown, you will have a few options. They are to turn the computer off, restart the computer, restart in MS-DOS mode, or close all programs and log on as a different user. The second area is the Explorer. The Explorer provides more capabilities than the File Manager. It allows you to view the file system and all available resources, including attached peripheral devices. You can view the contents of various folders by expanding and collapsing branches of the tree diagram. This is a graphic of the system's resources, and it is found on the left side of the Explorer window. The right side of the Explorer window displays the contents of the folders selected on the left side. Just double-click to open the documents, folders, or applications. Windows Explorer allows you to copy and move files from one directory to another. It also allows you to create shortcuts. To do this, drag the file to the desktop or copy the file and then paste the shortcut on the desktop. You can set the Windows Explorer to show or hide three-letter DOS file name extensions. Maybe you would rather have a desktop that is not cluttered. To accomplish this, you can operate almost exclusively in the Explorer mode. Also, every Windows 95 folder window can display a mini Explorer. The third area that you should understand is the control panel. Its purpose is to provide a centralized location for all utilities needed to set up or configure a computer's system software and hardware. In the control panel, you will find several applets, which are small-scale applications. There is a system applet which allows you to review all physical and hardware devices present, and where possible, change their configuration. It also lets you view CPU, RAM, and hard disk controllers. There is a display applet which combines all of the controls that affects your computer's screen display. With this applet, you can change or preview desktop patterns, wallpaper, and screen savers. It lets you customize things such as colors of windows, font types, font sizes, and the color of text. It can also configure your display type by choosing the number of colors in the screen resolution. There is the printers folder which contains the printer setup and printer control. No more print manager. The passwords applet is the final one we'll discuss. This function allows you to permit different users on the same computer to have their personalized profiles and desktop settings. There are many ways to customize Windows 95 to your preference. You can change the background. This can be done one of two ways. The first is to click on Start, then go to Settings, and then to the Control Panel. After choosing that, select Display. You will have the choice of changing the background, screensaver, settings, and appearance, which can change the color of the menu bar, font size, or font type. You can use the preset choices or customize your own and save this information. The second way you can change it is by clicking the right mouse button on the background. This will bring up a menu that will let you choose properties. You can also rename items on your desktop. To do this, move the mouse pointer over the icon, then to change the name, click the right mouse button. Choose Rename, and then type in the new name, and either press Return or click somewhere else on the screen. You may be a little surprised to find out that the mouse buttons are different from previous programs. The left mouse button is used to single or double click, and the right mouse button will bring up a menu about the item you click on. These items on the right-click menu are the most commonly used items in Windows 95. When it is on the desktop and you click it, you have the choice to arrange icons by the way you choose, alphabetically, by size, or date last accessed. You can line up icons, and it is possible to paste or paste shortcut. New gives you the choice of a new folder or shortcut. You can also choose properties, or can choose to minimize all windows at once. You can do this by clicking the right mouse button over the taskbar area and then choose Minimize All Windows. You can change the mouse properties by using the Buttons function to make it right or left-handed. By default, the mouse is set for right-handed. This means that the left button functions as Normal Select and Normal Drag. 
The right button is a context menu and special drag. When you click and drag with the right mouse button like this, you have a menu of options appear. If you choose to make it left-handed, these properties are just reversed or switched. By selecting pointers, you can choose what type of pointer you want. You can even choose 3D pointers or an animated hourglass. It is also possible to choose what size pointer you want. If you select motion, you can set the pointer speed and turn the pointer trails on or off. Pointer trails are generally used on laptops. The general category is used to tell you the type of mouse that is being used. You can have as many shortcut icons on your desktop as you want. These will allow you easy access to areas that you frequently use. You can then drag the item with the right mouse button to the desktop. Another way to create a shortcut icon is to copy the program or folder. Then go to the desktop, click the right mouse button and then choose the paste shortcut. Windows 95 has three wizards which are special applets that guide you step by step through a particular process. The two wizards we will discuss are the Add Printer wizard, which you can access by double-clicking the Add Printer icon. There is also the New Device Installation wizard, which you can activate by double-clicking on Add Device in the Control Panel folder. This is typically used for non-plug-and-play devices. Plug-and-play is a very important feature of Windows 95. Without it, you would have to switch cables around change settings, and just keep trying until you got lucky and it worked. With plug and play, it's much easier. The way it works is that first your system identifies the devices on the motherboard plus the external devices. This would be disk drives, a keyboard, your video display, and other adapter cards. Then, the system determines the resource requirements of each device, and also determines which have been fixed requirements, and which can be reconfigured. Next, it allocates the resources remaining after considering other devices in use. After that, it creates a final system configuration and stores resource allocation data for this configuration in the registry. It also searches the system directory to find the required device driver that is needed. If the device driver is missing, you will be prompted to insert the manufacturer's floppy disk. Then it loads the driver into memory. Finally, it completes startup operations. Windows 95 Advanced Functions Eliminating programs no longer needed from the startup group. It is always a good idea to have programs in your startup group, but it bogs down your computer to load programs that aren't needed anymore. The process for eliminating these programs isn't very difficult. Begin by clicking the right mouse button on your taskbar. Choose Properties from the Context menu. Click on the Start Menu Program tab Choose the Remove button, and this will display a list of files and folders. Use the Remove Shortcuts and Folders window to choose the groups or files you want to terminate. Then, click the Remove button. Remember that this doesn't kill the program completely. It just removes it from the shortcut application that channels it into the startup group. Switching Screen Resolutions in Windows 95. Right-click anywhere on your desktop and choose Properties from the Context menu that appears. Click the Display tab in the Properties box. Then, it's possible to adjust resolution by using the slider bar to drag left or right. After you've made a selection, Windows 95 will display the new resolution. You will also see a prompt to verify that the selection made was the right one. If it doesn't look good, Windows 95 offers a default that goes back to the original resolution. But to do this, you must tell the program not to accept the change. Font Manipulation It is possible to see samples of your fonts by double-clicking on the folder in your control panel. This is a way to access a list of fonts that are already installed in your computer. Double-click on the icon that represents the font that you would like to preview. There is a similarity program that allows you to match your fonts to other computers that offer different selections. You can choose the Fonts folder, then select the View menu and click List Fonts by Similarity. Then choose the font you want. Now you will see a list of fonts that are similar to the one selected. After that, 
You can select an example of a similar font by double-clicking on the appropriate icon. Quick system check. Does your system seem a bit slower after adding Windows 95? We'll show you a quick way to check your system. Begin by activating the system monitor. This is a set of utilities that monitors the CPU for functionality. You can check hard disk access time, memory that's in use, and many other subsystems. Click the Select Utilities box and then choose the system you want to monitor from the View menu. At this point, it is possible to check the performance of any system listed. Putting the control panel in the startup menu. The Windows 95 control panel is extremely important. It offers control of your system settings and commands. If you plan on installing lots of software and possibly adding some new hardware, the control panel needs to be easily accessible. To bring the control panel to the startup menu, right click the start button. Then choose explore from the context menu. At this point, you may click on any empty space in the right hand side of the explorer window. Next, from the context menu, choose New and click on the folder. This is done to create a new folder under Start. Now you're ready to enter a command over New Folder. Type Control Panel bracket ZIE C2020 dash 3A EA dash 1069 dash A 2DD dash 0800 2B 30309D end bracket. This will display the control panel when you click on the start button. Make a new boot disk. When you're upgrading to Windows 95, it's a great time to remove all the glitches from your hard drive disk. Before you do anything, back up your database. You can use floppies or a tape backup system works even better. Then from DOS, use the commands fdisk, then format, backslash s, which will create a fresh boot disk. Next, restart your computer to the C prompt. Then install Windows 95 from floppies. This takes longer than installing the program from a CD-ROM application, but it puts a completely flawless operating system on your hard drive disk. Once Windows 95 is activated, Reinstall Windows 95 from the CD-ROM drive. This will give you access to applications, drivers, and media clips on your disk. When you've completed this process, run your regular scan disk and defrag programs. Now your hard disk drive is in perfect working order. At this point, reinstall DOS and other Windows programs that you plan on using. Now you can restore your database to a squeaky clean operating system. Key Commands F2 will allow user to remove a file, directory, or any other item selected. F3 is used to find folders and files. F5. This will recover a window in my computer and explorer. F6 is used to switch from left and right areas of the explorer. Alt F4. This will close any Windows application or the Windows 95 operating system. Control Escape. This will display the Start menu. Control A. This key command will allow you to select All in Explorer or My Computer. Control G. Go to the Explorer. Shift and right click on an icon, then select delete. This will allow you to delete a file directly without wasting time using the recycle bin. Shift F10 will allow you to see the shortcut for any item or icon you've selected. Next, to shut down your PC, click start, then shut down. Wait for the screen to indicate that the computer is ready to be shut off. It is important to wait for this acknowledgement because turning off your computer too quickly can cause a loss of information. This concludes our look at Windows 95. 
We hope that this video has helped to simplify the process of learning the software. Enjoy the new user-friendly interface and make your life a little easier. Thank you for choosing Silicon Mountain Training and consider our product anytime that you would like to learn about the latest software and hardware. Survival in the computer age means knowing how to use a personal computer both in the office and at home. The electronic office is here now. Computer programs such as word processing, spreadsheets, and databases are used every day in thousands of offices. In the home, a computer is becoming essential for jobs such as doing your taxes and so your children can learn personal computing. If you have an IBM PC or compatible computer, the starting point to computer literacy is MS-DOS. Our objective is to give newcomers to personal computing a working knowledge of MS-DOS so they can be productive as soon as possible. Fortunately, you don't need to be a technical wizard to use your computer. Here's what you'll learn. The first lesson is an overview of what MS-DOS is and how to start it. Next, You'll find out about MS-DOS commands and how to use them for tasks such as starting an application program. Then there will be information on how to use floppy disks. Following that is a discussion of the files which contain your data. Lesson 5 is a quick introduction to hard disk drives. Finally, I'll show you some special features to speed up your work. These skills are basic to using your IBM PC or compatible computer. We won't cover every nut and bolt, but we will stick to the features needed for a newcomer to be more productive quickly. Today I'm talking about version 3.3 .3 of MS-DOS. If you have an older version, most of what's said still applies, but you may need to consult your user manuals on occasion. Our demonstrator computer is a PC compatible with dual floppy disk drives, a hard disk drive, and a printer. Of course, I assume you know how to connect the components of your computer how to care for the disk, and how the keyboard is laid out. In particular, your hardware must be properly installed and connected. The hard disk should be formatted and configured. If you're not sure about this, ask your dealer to do this for you. I'll explain the concepts, features, and commands of MS-DOS. While Diane demonstrates these things, I suggest you first view this tape in its entirety then review each lesson and try the demonstration shown in it. Together, we'll provide you computer literacy in an easy to learn way. On that note, Steve, it's time for the first lesson. Our first lesson describes what MS-DOS does for you and how to start it on your PC. We begin the lesson with an overview of its major functions. MS-DOS is one example of a class of computer programs called operating systems. An operating system supervises all activities inside your computer. It's the basic tool on your computer. For example, whenever you turn on the power, MS-DOS initializes all the electronic chips and components. It then accepts commands you type on the keyboard and carries them out. As it executes your commands, it coordinates data flow between various components, such as the memory, disk drives, and the printer. It also has facilities for managing the data on your disks. Finally, MS-DOS starts other programs, such as word processors, spreadsheets, and database managers. In case you're wondering, here's what the initials mean. MS is short for Microsoft, the maker of MS-DOS. The D stands for disk and means it works with disk drives. The OS is short for operating system. I'll use the abbreviation DOS from now on. There are two ways to start DOS. One, when the computer is off, 
and the other when the computer is on. When the computer's power is off, insert the DOS master disk in drive A, making sure the label is facing up and the oblong slot faces in. Close the disk drive door and power on the monitor, computer, and printer. Soon the disk drive begins working. DOS is being read from the disk into memory where it will reside. The monitor should then display some product information and a date prompt. DOS is asking you either to accept the date shown or type a new one. Diane will demonstrate how to enter a new date. Just type it in a month, day, year format using slashes or hyphens for separators. Then press the enter key. Now DOS prompts you to accept the time shown or type a new one. The time must be typed in a 24-hour military format. Again, press the enter key. Next, DOS's identification appears followed by the characters A and right arrow. These last two characters are called DOS prompt and mean that DOS is asking you what to do. This normal startup procedure is nicknamed a cold boot because it starts with the power off and because the technical name of the process is the bootstrap loader. By the way, the enter key might be called return key on your computer. The other startup procedure is used when the computer is on. Diane will show us how. Simultaneously, press the Alt, Control, and Delete keys. Then wait for the date prompt to appear and proceed as if it were a cold boot. This other procedure is called a system restart. Understandably, it's nicknamed a warm boot because the power is on. It should be used when you want to change system disks, which I'll explain in a later lesson. It's also used in those rare instances when your computer seems to lock up and doesn't respond. There's one caution when using a warm boot to recover from a system lockup. Be sure to wait long enough before doing it. Sometimes the computer takes a while to execute a command and you could lose data. Here's a quick summary of the first lesson. DOS is your computer's operating system. It's the supervisor of system activity. DOS is normally loaded from a disk by a cold boot or by a warm boot if you're changing system disks or the computer locks up. Now that DOS is up and running, let's make it do something for us. In this lesson, you'll find out how to give DOS commands. A command is simply an order for DOS to do something, like print a file or copy a disk. Here's a demonstration of a simple command. At the DOS prompt, I'm typing the word DIR and pressing Enter. This command shows a directory of files on disk drive A. The listing should look like this and overflow the screen. We can fix the overflow problem with an option. At the DOS prompt, Diane types DIR, a space, a forward slash, and a P, then enter. This gets us the page display option. The directory listings fill up the monitor and then pauses to give you enough time to view it. The directory has one line of information per file. The first column shows the file name. The second column shows the file extension. Next is the file size in bytes. Then come the date and the time the file was last modified. To continue with the next page, press any key. Obviously, this option is useful for disk with lots of files. Usually, commands have several options. So let's see another. At the DOS prompt, Diane types DIR, a space, a forward slash, and a W, then enter. This gets us the wide display option of the directory command. The display consists only of file names. It's convenient if you only want to know what files are on the disk without having their live stories. There's a fourth option to this command that's quite useful. After the command name, type a space, then a file name, and as always, the enter key. This option gets the directory for a specific file, in this case, command.com. This option is useful to find out whether a specific file exists. 
Now for one final option. For this demo, the second disc that comes with your DOS package goes into drive B. After the directory command name, we'll use the option B colon. This option gets a directory of files on another disk drive, in this case, the B drive. Commands and options must be typed in a particular format called a syntax. Each command has its own particular syntax as documented in the DOS user's manual. Even so, there is a generic syntax for commands which applies in most cases. Usually the command name comes first, followed by any options. The first option is the disk drive name, which consists of the drive letter and a colon. If there is no drive name, DOS assumes the command applies to files on the default disk drive. That's shown by the letter on the DOS prompt. The next option is the name of the file on which the command must do its work. Third comes the switches. These switches invoke special features, such as the page display of the directory command. Switch options consist of a forward slash and option letter. Finally, come any arguments to the command. These usually provide extra information needed by switches. Here's another note or two. DOS commands are separated into two types, internal and external. The internal commands are the most frequently used, so they reside in memory for speedy execution. External commands are infrequently used, so they reside on a disk and must be read into memory before they can be executed. DOS commands can be typed in either lower or upper case. Options are usually separated by at least one space unless the manual tells you otherwise. An exception is drive name and file name. They must be together when referring to a file that's not on the default drive. Commands aren't executed until the enter key is pressed. This allows you to change your mind. By the way, the user's reference manual has special symbols for defining command syntax. Be sure to learn these symbols. Knowing these basics, it's time to learn more simple commands. The command date causes the startup date prompt to appear. It's handy if you forget the date. Of course, the system date can be changed with this command, but most often you'll only press enter to continue on without changing it. To get the current time, just use the time command. This causes the startup time prompt to be displayed. Press enter to continue on without changing the system time. The clear screen command erases the entire monitor. This command is handy for reducing visual clutter. Now we need to briefly revisit the DOS prompt. Earlier I said the default disk drive is indicated by the letter in the DOS prompt. Whenever a command is typed without a drive name, DOS searches for the default drive for files. The default drive is changed by simply typing another drive name. For example, type B colon and press enter to default to the B drive. Type A colon and enter to restore the default to the A drive. The default drive should be the one having the files you work on most often. At some point, you'll want to run an application program such as a word processor. Let's see a demo of a simple text editor application called Headline, which comes with the DOS master disk. The command line has the application name and the file name, scrap.txt. This starts the editor and creates a text file called scrap.txt. Note that an asterisk appears. This is Edline's prompt. It tells you that DOS has taken a back seat and you're interacting with Edline itself. Typing an I allows text to be input. I'll type a couple of lines of text. Each line is ended by pressing the Enter key. To terminate input mode, the control and Z keys are pressed at the same time, followed by the enter key. Finally, an E is typed to exit the editor. The DOS prompt will reappear, and the text file now exists 
on the default drive. Obviously, full-blown word processors are more complex, but the same syntax is used to start them. The program name is followed by the names of any drives and files needed, and finally by any switch options and arguments. Be sure to consult your user manual provided with the application program. Let's review the basics of DOS commands. A command is an order to your computer. It often has several options. The command must be typed in a certain way, known as its syntax. Commands work on files on the default drive unless otherwise indicated. An application program is started by using its name as a DOS command. It's time to find out some important things about disks. We'll describe basic disk commands, what system disks are, and a couple of handy utility commands. The memory inside the computer is volatile. Its contents vanish when the power is turned off. On the other hand, disks provide a non-volatile storage medium for important documents. A disk is like a magnetic filing cabinet because it contains many documents and folders. Before any disk can be used, it must be formatted. Data is stored on the disk surface in concentric circles called tracks. Each track is further divided into sectors. The formatting process creates the tracks and sectors. It also puts a skeleton directory on the disk. Finally, it checks the disk for defective spots and marks them so DOS won't use them. Formatting is a simple operation, as you'll see in this demo. With the DOS master disk in drive A, I'll type the command format, followed by the drive name B. A prompt appears to insert a blank, unformatted disk in drive B. After doing so, I'll press Enter to start the formatting. DOS lets you know it's working by displaying the head and cylinder count. These are technical names for disk side and track number. When done, a report appears showing the results. Another prompt appears in case you have more disks to format. Typing N and pressing Enter terminates the command. Label this MS-DOS 3.3 working copy. Right now it's empty, but we'll put DOS on it in a little while. Here's an important caution. The format command will erase any data that's already on a disk. If you format a disk that has files on it, make sure you don't need them. The format command also has options to label a disk. Select the number of sectors per track and copy system files. The first two options will be explained now, and the system file option will be explained under the subject of system disks. Let's see the label option. Again, the command name has the drive name B, followed by a forward slash V. When prompted, Diane inserts another blank disk in drive B and presses Enter. When formatting is done this time, DOS prompts for a volume label. This label is nothing more than a title which is recorded on the disk. Diane's using the name DOS 332 of 2. The volume label can be up to 11 characters long. We can skip formatting another disk. In a later demonstration, you'll see how to copy data onto it. Usually, DOS formats your floppy disk with nine sectors per track. However, you may need a different number of sectors for a special purpose. For example, you might have a high capacity five and a quarter inch disk drive in your computer, or a three and a half inch disk drive. Also, some older DOS systems used eight sectors per track. If you're exchanging disks with those systems, you need to handle this difference. These cases are handled with the switch options of the format command. The various sector options are described in your user's reference manual. We don't need to cover them further. 
an important basic disk operation is copying. The disk copy command does a track by track copy from one disk to another. This demo shows how to make a working copy of the DOS master with the disk copy command. The command has drive names A and B for options. The disk being copied is called the source disk and it's the first drive name in the command. The disk receiving the data is called the destination disk and it's the second drive name. Our source disk is already in drive A. So the DOS working copy goes in drive B. Remember, disk copy needs a formatted disk to receive the data. Press any key, such as the space bar, and wait. Disk copying takes many seconds. We don't need to copy another disk right now, so I'll terminate the command. Store the master disk in a safe place. Use the DOS working copy disk from now on. Test out the DOS copy by doing a warm boot. Remember, that's Control, Alt, and Delete. You should see the startup prompts. Proceed as if it's a normal boot up. Always make a working copy of any master disk before using it. This includes disks with application programs as well as DOS masters. Also, make backup copies of data disks. If a data disk is in daily use, I recommend backing it up at least once a day. Earlier, I mentioned something called system disks. A system disk contains certain important files known as system files. These hold the DOS core and all the DOS internal commands. They're needed to start up your computer. Only a system disk can be used to boot up the computer. The system file option of the format command makes a system disk. Now I'll demonstrate how. After the command name and drive name, use a slash s. I'll use another blank disk. After DOS formats the disk, it copies the system files to it. Again, I'll skip formatting another disk. This disk will be labeled System 1. Each new system disk must be tested. Use the warm boot and reply to the prompts. The DOS copy gets returned to drive A. As you saw earlier, the complete DOS disk is very crowded because it contains system files and external commands. There's little room left for an application program and documents. On the other hand, a disk with an application program on it may also be crowded and not have much room for documents. So the normal software configuration for a dual floppy disk system has either the DOS disk or the application disk in drive A and a separate document disk in drive B. Most users like to make an application disk a system disk. When they format the working copy of the application disk, they use the system files option of the format command. Then they copy application programs from the application master disk to the working copy. This way they can start the computer with application disk and start the application right away. Sometimes, special hardware options or certain application programs need extra system files on a system disk. If so, the user manual for that hardware or software will list what has to be done. Here's a couple of commands which provide disk utility functions. The check disk command scans a disk for errors and optionally fixes them. Let's see a demonstration. The check disk command is abbreviated CHK DSK and the drive name follows. It's now checking the disk in drive A for any errors such as bad sectors. When done, a report is displayed. As you see, this disk has no errors. The fix option is invoked with the slash F switch. In normal practice, this option is used on a disk only when errors are found. Check disks should be done occasionally on data disks which are used infrequently. Use it just before updating them. 
The label command will either add or change a label on a disk. Let's see this done to a DOS working copy. At the DOS prompt, Diane types the command followed by the drive name. A prompt appears for the new label. It can be up to 11 characters long. We're using DOS 331 of 2. We've seen a lot of information, so a brief recap is in order. A disk is a magnetic filing cabinet. Disks must be formatted before use. Make backup copies of important disks. System disks can be used to boot up the computer. The normal configuration is a DOS disk or an application system disk in drive A and a data disk in drive B. Most of the time you'll work on data stored on files, so this lesson explains how to use them. A disk file is the magnetic equivalent of a document. A file can be a letter, a spreadsheet, an address list, or even an application program. Each file has unique identification made up according to certain rules. The first part is the file name. It can be up to eight characters long, it starts with an alphabetic character, and can contain alphanumeric characters. The second part of the ID is called the file name extension. It begins with a period and can be up to three characters long. It too can contain alphanumeric characters. Extensions classify files according to their use. Here's a list of often used extensions. Usually, applications automatically assign extensions, such as the last two items on this list. Certain names are reserved by DOS and shouldn't be used for file names or extensions. A list of these are in your reference manual. Of course, the directory command shows file names and extensions. Now that we can identify files, let's learn some basic file operations starting with the copy command. The disk system 1 goes in drive B. It'll be the scratch pad. The copy command needs two options. The first is drive name A plus file name scrap.txt and the second is drive name B plus file name scrap.txt. Note that the drive name and file name are not separated by spaces. This command copies the source file, that's the first option, to the destination file, which is the second option. A directory for B verifies that. That's how to copy a file, Steve. You can also make a copy on the same disk. The command copy drive B scrap.txt followed by drive B scrap.dupe makes a duplicate file with a different extension. A directory for drive B now shows two scrap files. There are shortcuts. If the source file is on the default drive, the drive name can be omitted, so these two commands are equivalent. Also, if you don't give a file name for the destination, the file name of the source will be used. Hence, these two commands are equivalent. The delete command erases files. For instance, the command del drive name b file name scrap.txt will delete the scrap text file on drive b. The directory shows its absence. Here's an important caution. Be sure you don't need a file before deleting it, especially if the disk isn't backed up. The rename command changes file names. Here the command ren is changing the file name scrap.txt to quick.txt. A directory on the former file name shows that it's gone. But a directory on the new file name shows the data is still present, but with the new name. 
DOS provides wildcard characters to work on a group of files with one command. They're very flexible and sometimes dangerous. The question mark wildcard allows any character to occupy a specific position in the file name. Here's the directory command with a file name of mo question mark question mark dot exe. What you get is a directory of files on the default disk which have file names exactly four characters long, start with mo, and have an extension of exe. The question marks allowed DOS to accept any character in the third or fourth position of the file name. The question mark is handy to find a group of files with similar names. For example, if these files existed on the default disk, they can be found with the directory command shown. The asterisk wildcard likewise allows any character in a specific position, but it also allows any character in any of the remaining positions. We'll need some examples. The directory command with file name f asterisk dot exe shows all files starting with s and having the extension exe on the default disk. The asterisk allowed DOS to accept only file names starting with an s regardless of how long the name was. Now for a variation, the file name asterisk dot exe gets a directory of every file with an extension of exe on the default disk. In this case, the asterisk allowed DOS to accept any file name regardless of how long the name was. Wildcards can be used in almost any file name or extension. The command ren asterisk dot text asterisk dot doc changes the extension of any text file to doc. The command del drive name b asterisk dot dupe deletes every file with an extension of dupe from the disk drive in drive b. Now for one more example. The disk in drive a is replaced with the second DOS master disk. It must be labeled basic or utilities. The disk in b is replaced with the disk labeled ms DOS 3.3 2 of 2. The command copy asterisk dot asterisk drive B copies every file from disk A to disk B. The wildcard designation asterisk dot asterisk refers to all files on a disk. This is an extremely important word of caution. If a delete command uses the double asterisk wildcard, all files on the disk will be deleted, which can really ruin your day. Before using a wildcard with delete, be sure you know what it's going to do. Files can be protected physically by using a tab. It's applied over the right protect notch of the disk jacket. Specific files can be protected with the attribute command. It makes a specific file read only, which means the data cannot be changed accidentally. Before demonstrating this, Diane replaces the DOS working copy in drive A. The command name is a trib and has the option plus R and the file name quick.doc. The file is now read only. That's verified by using the same command without the plus R option. The R in the display means read only. To see how effective this is, the line editor command won't even open this file. To change the file back to read-write mode, the minus R option has to be used with the attribute command. At times, you may need to look at the contents of a file. Three different DOS commands let you do this. To display a text file on your monitor, use the type command. In this example, type is being used on the sample text file. For short files, this works well. Long files need different commands as we'll see later. The type command is designed only for text files created with Edline or from console input. If used with other files, strange things may appear on your monitor. The more command also displays a text file on the monitor, but only one screen full at a time. It's great for large files. 
A simple example will show this. I'll use the command type plus the name of a long file created just for this demo. Then comes a vertical bar and the word more. The screen fills up with text. This time, however, DOS stopped when it filled the monitor. To continue, press any key. The more command also works with the output of other commands. For instance, when used with the directory command, we see our old friend, the directory listing of the default disk. This time, DOS stopped when it filled up the monitor, rather than scrolling to the end of the directory. The vertical bar is called a pipe and must precede the word more. More uses something called standard input. These subjects are more fully discussed in our advanced tape on MS-DOS. The more command is designed for text files created with Edline or from console input. If used with other files, weird things may appear on your monitor. The print command sends a text file to your printer using background processing. That means DOS puts the file in a queue and prints it as time permits while executing other commands. The default print queue size is 10 files. Let's try this on our scrap file. The printer must be powered on and must be online. The name of the file to be printed follows the command name. A prompt may appear to get the printer device name. That's usually PRN and it's already shown as the default. When enter is pressed, the file is queued for printing. The print command is designed for text files created with Edline or from console input. If used with other files, strange and weird things may be printed. Many options exist for the print command, but we don't need them for basic operation. It's time to review the major points about files. A disk file is the equivalent of a document. It has a name constructed according to specific rules. There are commands for copying, deleting, renaming, and protecting files. Wildcards allow you to work on a whole group of files with a single command. DOS also has commands to examine the contents of files created only with Edline or from console input. Files created with application programs must be printed by that application. Hard drives are faster and bigger than floppy disks. If your computer has a hard drive, this lesson will give you a brief introduction to hard drives. Do a directory command with the drive name C. That's the usual name for hard drives. If its directory has entries like this, the hard disk has already been set up by the dealer and you can continue with this lesson. Otherwise, skip this lesson and get some experienced help because the hard disk setup is more involved. To boot up from a hard disk, the drive A door must be open. Use either a warm boot or a cold boot. The hard disk starts working. And these familiar prompts appear. Enter the date and the time. The DOS prompt now shows the hard drive name. Finally, close the door if the floppy will be used. The hard disk usually has a tree-like structure of subdirectories. A subdirectory is like a file folder. It's a subdivision of the disk which holds files on a single subject. The typical software configuration for a hard disk has a root directory containing a few special DOS files, plus several subdirectories, one for each different application. Each application subdirectory has the application programs plus document files, in normal operation, documents are created and updated directly on the hard disk, then backed up onto floppy disks. Subdirectories are noted on the directory by the abbreviation DIR in angle brackets. For example, our hard disk has several subdirectories, including one named MS-DOS, which contains files from the DOS master disks, and one called Edline for the DOS line editor. To move around this structure, the change directory command is used. Diane will show us how. The change directory command is abbreviated CD. The option consists of a backslash and a subdirectory name. That command put us in the MS-DOS 
subdirectory. A directory command only shows the files in a specific subdirectory. Here's another example. Change directory to edline. A directory command shows the DOS line editor and text documents here. They were created for this demo. If you ever forget what subdirectory you're in, just type the command CD only, and it'll display the subdirectory name. Once in a subdirectory, you run an application just by typing its name. The command edline, followed by the file name, new.txt, starts our familiar friend, the line editor, and creates a new text file. When you exit an application, you're still in the same subdirectory. So the procedure for subdirectories is to change the subdirectory containing the application you want to run and type its name and options. To get back to the starting directory, which is called the root directory, the change directory command needs only a backslash. Backing up and restoring a hard disk presents a problem because of the capacity differences between floppy and hard disks. It would take many floppies and much time to completely back up an entire hard disk that's chock full of data. And now I'll give you a shortcut that can be used with a single subdirectory. It uses the backup and restore commands, which are designed for hard disks. Make sure they exist in the MS-DOS subdirectory before trying this procedure. Prior to this demo, Diane copied these commands into the MS-DOS subdirectory from the second master disk in the DOS package. I also typed this command. It tells DOS which subdirectory has backup and restore. The command name backup has two options. The drive name C, a backslash, and the subdirectory name, and then the drive name B. This command will cause all files in the MS-DOS subdirectory to be backed up onto drive B. Formatted floppies are inserted as they are requested. Each one is marked with a sequence number. Otherwise, it might not be possible to restore files from them. Each file is listed as it's backed up, including its subdirectory name. Now for a couple of notes on backup. This shortcut erases any old files on the floppies so they can be reused for each backup. This shortcut only backs up the contents of a single subdirectory. Other backup options exist to get different variations. A restore command does a reverse of a backup command. Usually, a restore is only done when important data has been lost. For example, you might have accidentally deleted a file, or a program may have gotten hung up and damaged the file you were working on. Also, on very rare occasions, the hardware might have malfunctioned and wiped out data on the hard disk. The following procedure restores a single file in a subdirectory. The restore command needs the name of a drive containing the floppies, that's B, and the drive name, subdirectory, and file name to be restored. We're restoring file mode.com to the MS-DOS subdirectory. Floppies are inserted as they are requested. It's very important they be inserted in the same order they were backed up. That's the demo, Steve. Note these items about restore. To restore all the files on a subdirectory, use the double asterisk wildcard for a file name. However, if any of those files have been updated since the last backup, those updates will be lost. Restore won't work on system files. These have to be restored with the sys command, or sys command. Since we're done demonstrating hard disk, the default drive should be changed back to A. If you have a hard disk, remember these points. Get some experienced help to set up the hard disk. A subdirectory tree structure is typically used on a hard disk. Documents are created on the hard disk and backed up to floppies. To run an application, change to the subdirectory containing it and type its name and options. Special backup and restore commands must be used with hard disks. In our final lesson, you'll learn some features and tricks on how to speed up your work. 
Many of these features are invoked by special keys or combinations of keys. When the control key is pressed simultaneously with other keys, it gives special commands to the computer. Recall those long directories which scrolled off the monitor faster than you could read them? The control S combination stops the scrolling. Simultaneously pressing control and S during the scrolling halts it and allows the display to be examined. Pressing control S again resumes scrolling. If control and C are pressed while a command is working, they abort the command. For example, suppose a blank disk is inserted in drive B and the format command is typed. After it starts, pressing control and C simultaneously stops the formatting. The control C combination also aborts an application program. The control P combination enables the printer echo feature. Anything displayed on the monitor is echoed to the printer. As an example, if control P is typed and a directory command typed, the directory listing will be printed as well as displayed. To stop the printer echo, type control P again. The final control key combination is control Z. This is used as an end of input signal in certain cases. We've already seen it used to terminate input in the Edline editor. Certain keys have special editing functions to help speed typing commands. The last command is automatically stored in a place called a template. The special editing keys perform their editing functions on the contents of the template. A simple example is the function key F3. When pressed, it copies the characters in the template to the command line. It's an easy way to repeat a command with two keystrokes. Suppose the command type quick dot doc had just been entered. Pressing the F3 key causes the entire preceding command to appear on the command line. All you have to do is press enter to repeat the command. Function key F2 has a clever function called a copy up. When pressed, it copies characters from the template to the command line until it encounters a specific character which you type. To see how this works, suppose the command dir asterisk dot com had just been typed. Now suppose you want to get a directory of all files with an extension of exe. Pressing F2 and then C causes the previous command up to the letter C to appear on the monitor. By typing exe and enter, the new directory is displayed. If you make a mistake and want to terminate the command line, use the escape key and type a new command. Several other special editing keys are described in your reference manual. I suggest you experiment with them sometime and learn some clever keyboard tricks. I'll finish up this lesson with two other handy features. Occasionally, you may want to print the contents of the monitor but forgot to enable the printer echo. In that case, just use the print screen key. Hold the shift key, then press the print screen key at the same time. Whatever is on the monitor gets printed. Now for a demo of how to create a text file from console input. The command syntax is copy con short dot txt. It tells DOS to copy text from the console into the named file. Each line is terminated with enter. After typing the last line, Control Z must be pressed to terminate input, and Enter must be pressed one more time. Remember, to start console input, use the command copy con with a file name, then enter the text and terminate it with Control Z and Enter. Our final lesson has a very brief summary. Control keys provide extra commands. Special editing keys speed up typing commands. Other features exist to help you use DOS.
When you're ready to turn off the computer, make sure your last command is finished processing. If you're using an application program, make sure you exit from it first. The DOS prompt should be on the monitor. Remove all floppy disks, then turn off the computer, monitor, and printer. So that about wraps it up. You now know enough about DOS to use it productively. Both Steve and I thank you for viewing this tape. And we invite you back for more computer literacy in an easy to learn way. Spreadsheet software is the basic financial tool in the electronic office. It saves you time because it automates computations. Lotus123 is the standard for spreadsheet software, and it's the most impressive business tool today. Our goal is to give you a working knowledge of 123, so you can use spreadsheets in everyday applications. We've condensed half your software manual into this tape, and after viewing it, your manual will be much easier to follow. The material is divided into three major segments. The first segment has an overview of 123 and shows how to prepare the software. The second segment tells how to build simple spreadsheets. You'll see the basic workflow, filing and printing, business graphics and editing. The demonstrations for that segment feature construction of a budget spreadsheet. The final segment covers the building of complex spreadsheets, including complex formulas and documentations. The demonstrations for that segment show construction of a tax estimator spreadsheet. The subjects of databases, macros, final quality graphics, and the command language will be covered in our advanced tape on 123. We don't cover every nut and bolt. Instead, we will present the features that you need to be productive quickly. Our computer system is a PC compatible with dual floppy disk drives, a hard disk drive, and a printer. Its operating system is MS-DOS. We assume you know how to use DOS. If not, there's also a training video covering DOS available from Silicon Mountain. My job is explaining the concepts and features of 123. And my job is demonstrating the commands and procedures. I suggest you first view the tape in its entirety, then review each subject and try the demonstrations. Together, Libby and I will provide you computer literacy in an easy to learn way. We have a lot to cover, Pam, so let's get started. We begin with a short digest of what 123 does for you. Lotus 123 has three separate processors. First, it has an electronic spreadsheet for so-called number crunching applications. The spreadsheet stores the data and formulas needed for an application and automatically computes the result. 123 also has a business graphics processor for making pie charts, bar charts, and the like. Thirdly, it has a database for making and using lists such as address books and financial journals. These processors dramatically improve making and using spreadsheets for number-oriented applications. It's time to learn basic spreadsheet concepts. 123 arranges its memory like a columnar pad. Rows are labeled with numbers and columns with letters. The intersection of a row and column is called a cell. The cell address is simply the column letter plus the row number. A spreadsheet can have 8,192 rows and 256 columns. The monitor acts like a window and shows only a portion of the spreadsheet. Most of the action occurs in cells because they hold numbers, labels, or formulas. The value of a cell is the number or label that's displayed on the monitor. Sometimes the value is computed by a formula. For example, this formula sums the contents of cells B4 and B5. Suppose you change the number in cell B4. Asterisk 1, 2, 3 will automatically recompute the formula and display the sum. Recomputation is a valuable feature. With it, you can play what if by pressing only a few keys. Some formulas use built-in functions. These are predefined computations. A good example is the summation of these numbers. The longhand formula would look like this. 
Instead, we can use the function sum in the formula. Clearly, it's a shorter method. 123 offers a wide range of built-in functions used for engineering, finance, and statistical analysis. Directions are given to 123 by typing commands on the keyboard. Commands are chosen from menus shown in the control panel. Two types of output are provided by the software. A report is simply a printout of the spreadsheet. Of more interest is a business graphic such as this bar chart. That wraps up the overview. Next, we'll tell you how to prepare the software. The two major items of preparation are installing and starting the software. Before installing 123, make sure you have the correct hardware and software. Your software manual should list these. The software is shipped on several disks. These include the 123 system disk and its backup, the install library disk, the utility disk, and the print graph disk. The software configuration will depend on what kind of disks your system has. For a hard disk system, the C drive holds the programs and data files, while the A drive will be used to start up the program. For dual floppy disk systems, the A drive is used for the 123 system disk, and the B drive is used for data disks. Installation has two steps. Copy certain floppy disks and files and install the driver set. For hard disk systems, use these procedures. Start your computer and get the C prompt. The hard disk should already be formatted. Make a subdirectory with the name 123. Then change to that subdirectory. Insert the 123 system disk into drive A. Type copy, a space, A colon, asterisk dot, asterisk, another space, forward slash V, and press enter. This copies the system disk into the subdirectory. Also, copy the install library disk, the utility disk, and the print graph disk. Now we need to install the driver sets. These are files which control hardware operation. Type install, press enter, and wait for the instruction screen. Press enter again to get the main menu. Follow the step-by-step -step instructions to tell install what hardware you have. Libby will show us a few of the steps. Select first time installation by pressing enter. After reading the instructions, press enter. The next menu tells install if there's a hard disk. We do, so I'll press enter. Again, read the instructions and press enter. Use the down arrow to select the no option and press enter. This omits copy protection from the hard disk. Continue responding to install until it saves your replies on disk. Then exit the program. If you have a dual floppy system, use these procedures to install 123. Back up the install library disk, the utility disk, and the print graph disk. With the DOS disk in drive A, insert the 123 system disk into drive B. Copy command.com from drive A to drive B and verify.
Swap the disk in drive B with the backup system disk and repeat the copy command. Do the same for the print graph disk. If your MS-DOS version is 3.2 or later, copy Command-COM only to the print graph disk. Now for the driver sets. Replace the disk in drive A with the utility disk. Type install, press enter, and wait for the instruction screen. Then follow the first time installation instructions as we did previously. It's time to start the software. If you have a hard disk system, use this startup procedure. Insert the 123 system disk in drive A. Make sure you're in a 123 subdirectory. Type 123 and press enter. Shortly, a logo appears followed by a blank spreadsheet. Remove the system disk and you're ready to work. For a dual floppy disk system, use these startup procedures. Make sure you have the A prompt. Insert the 123 system disk in drive A. Type 123 and press enter. The logo appears followed by a blank spreadsheet. Insert a data disk in drive B and you're ready to work. Let's get better acquainted with the 123 screen display. The three lines at the top of the monitor are called the control panel. Row numbers and column letters are displayed in the highlighted border. Below the border is the spreadsheet proper. The bright rectangle is called the cell pointer. It shows the current cell. The upper right corner has the mode indicator. Ready means 123 is ready for a command or data to be entered. The lower left corner is the message area. It shows the date and time and also shows error messages. We have a couple of other things to do at this time. The default printer setting should be checked. Use the worksheet global default status command. Press the forward slash key to get the main command menu. Then type W, G, D, and S. Only the first letter of each word in the command is needed. The current printer settings are displayed. 123 assumes your printer is connected to the first parallel port. The default page is 66 lines long with top and bottom margins of two lines each. It also has left and right margins at columns 4 and 76. The printer name chosen with install should be displayed. Also, check the default directory name used for filing operations. For a hard disk system, it should be C colon backslash 123. Press enter to clear the display and press Q to exit the menu. For dual floppy disk systems, the default directory has to be entered. Use the worksheet global default directory command. Type slash W, G, D, and D. Press escape to erase the A drive name and type B colon backslash. Then press Enter and Q. The new default has to be saved to disk with the worksheet Global Default Update Command. Type slash W G D U. Wait a couple seconds. Then type Q. Every time you start 123, the new setting will be in effect. If you make a mistake on a command, there's an escape mechanism to correct it. Suppose you typed the wrong letter in a command. Press the escape key repeatedly until the command menus disappear and retype the command. 
Also, if the mode indicator flashes an error when you're typing, read the explanation in the message area and press escape to clear the error. At this point, we'll stop to preview the next segment about simple spreadsheets. There's a definite method for building a spreadsheet. Libby and I will show you that method. Next, you'll learn about filing operations and about printing reports. The following subject shows how to make business graphics. The sixth subject explains how to edit spreadsheets. Our demonstration spreadsheet is a simple budget. It uses only one screen. It also computes the budget surplus with a simple formula. Let's begin our study of simple spreadsheets. Even the simplest spreadsheet should be built with a step-by-step -step method. It keeps your work organized and flowing smoothly. Here's a brief digest of the steps in the spreadsheet workflow. Start by sketching out a model on paper. Then set up the spreadsheet on the computer. Continue by entering data and formulas. Next, format and protect cells. Be sure to save the spreadsheet on disk, and finally, print it. Our paper sketch is done, and we're ready for the details of using this workflow. Set up the global items first. A global item affects the overall format and content of the spreadsheet. For example, the column widths can be changed to accept large numbers. The default global settings are displayed with the worksheet status command. That's invoked by typing a forward slash W and S. Press enter to clear the display. Libby will change the column width to 12 characters with the worksheet global column width command. Type a forward slash W, G, and C. Just type 12 and press enter. Instantly, all the columns are resized to the new width. To finish the spreadsheet setup, format specific columns. For example, the budget model has long labels in column A, so it should be widened to 16 characters. The command to use is worksheet column set width. The cell pointer must be in the column to be widened. Type a slash, W, C, and S. Type 16 and press enter. Note how the column width is adjusted. That concludes spreadsheet setup. The next step is entry of data and formulas. Do the labels first. They're used for row and column headings. With the arrow keys, move the pointer to cell B1 and type the label MONTHLY BUDGET in all caps. As you type, the entry appears in the edit line of the control panel. When done, press enter and the label appears in the cell. Line 1 of the control panel shows the complete label. The apostrophe is a label prefix and is supplied by the 123. I'll move the pointer to cell A3 and type another label. The down arrow key causes the label to appear in the cell and moves the pointer down one cell. To save time, We'll skip watching Libby enter all the labels in column A. Now for something that's both clever and efficient. In cell B6, type a backslash, a dash, and enter. Immediately, the entire cell is filled with dashes. Cell B16 gets the same entry. 
The backslash is called the repeat label prefix because it repeats any character which follows it. Let's move on to entering the budget number. It's just as easy as entering labels. With the pointer on cell B4, I'll type the number 2000 without a dollar sign, comma, or decimal point. When enter is pressed, the number appears in the cell in the same format. This is called general format. In a few minutes, it will be changed to the currency format. While Libby continues, I've got a couple of notes on entering numbers. Numeric values must start with one of these characters. Only one decimal point is permitted in a number. Formulas are usually entered after the labels and numbers. It's a simple procedure as shown in this demo. The total income formula will go in cell B7. Type a leading plus sign to show the start of a formula. Then type the cell address B4, another plus sign, address B5, and press enter. That's it. The value is calculated and displayed. The formula must start with one of these formula indicator characters. Of course, addition is not the only operation used with this formula. The other mathematical operations of subtraction, multiplication, etc. can be used. For a complete list, consult your manual. The paper model indicates the second formula should use the sum function. Here's how a built-in function is constructed. The function starts with an at sign. The function name follows immediately. Inputs to the function are called arguments, and they're enclosed in parentheses. The sum function has one argument, and that's the range of cells to add up. Note the range format. Cell addresses are separated by one or two periods. To enter this function, move the pointer to cell B17. Type the function and press enter. So far, we've entered cell addresses by typing out the complete address. An easier way is the pointer method. The cell address is taken from the location of the pointer. A good example for showing this is the third formula. The formula goes in cell B19. Type a plus sign. Now move the pointer to the total income cell B7. The cell address automatically appears in the formula. Type a minus sign. The pointer returns to the cell being defined. To continue, move the pointer to the total expenses cell, B17, and press enter. Again, the address appears in the formula automatically, and the value is calculated and displayed. As a rule of thumb, use the pointer method for cells close to other cells being defined, and use typing for cells that are distant. It's time to move on to the next step in the workflow. The data and formulas must be formatted and protected. You may have noticed that 123 accepts data in only one way, which is called the general format. Hence the need to display cells in many other formats. The range format command does this for specific cells. I'll show you how to change the general format to the currency format. Type a slash, R, F, and C to call up the range format currency command. The currency format defaults to two decimal places. Accept this by pressing enter. Then type the range of cells to be formatted. In this case, it cells B4 through B19. Press enter, and instantly the numbers are formatted with dollar signs, commas, and decimal points. I've got some extra notes on formatting. Negative currency values are shown in parentheses. Numbers can only be right justified. If the formatted value is too large for a cell, 
a string of asterisks is shown. The default format for labels is left justified, as shown by the apostrophe. Other label formats are possible, including center and right justified. To get them, type one of these label prefix characters at the start of the label. We're almost done building the spreadsheet. The next step is to apply protection. You can shield the cells from accidental changes or deletions. This protection is usually applied to labels and formulas only. The procedure is to first apply protection to the entire spreadsheet and then remove it from cells with numbers. The command Worksheet Global Protection Enable protects the entire spreadsheet. Type slash W, G, P, and E. The command to remove protection is Range Unprotect. Type slash R and U, followed by the cell range B4 to B5, and press Enter. In effect, a hole has been cut into the protective shield over those cells. Two additional commands are useful for applying and removing protection. Use the range protect command to protect specific cells. Use worksheet global protection disable to remove protection from all cells. The control panel shows the protection status of a cell in line one. Our budget spreadsheet is constructed and almost ready for use. We've seen a lot of information, so a brief recap is in order. There's a definite workflow for building spreadsheets. Sketch the model on paper, set up the spreadsheet on the computer, enter data and formulas, format and protect cells, then save it and print it. The last two steps are shown in the next subject. Now we cover the commands used to file and print a spreadsheet. 123 uses certain predefined file types. These types are shown by the file extension. Spreadsheet files have an extension of WK1 and so on. Of course, a 123 file name must follow DOS rules. Eight characters for the name plus a three character extension. The two basic filing operations are saving and retrieving. A file save command stores the current spreadsheet on a disk. Simply type slash F and S, and a file name prompt appears. If you have a hard drive, the default path name is already supplied. The first time you save a spreadsheet, type only the file name and press Enter. The extension is supplied automatically. The spreadsheet will be saved into the file. Veteran users save their work every 15 minutes or so in case of a power failure. To save the same spreadsheet again, type slash F and S. The file name you last used appears. Press Enter then type R to replace the file. The file retrieve command calls up a spreadsheet from the disk. To demonstrate a retrieve, Libby will erase the current spreadsheet. The keys are slash W, E, and Y. To retrieve a file, type slash F and R, and a prompt appears. Then press Enter. The spreadsheet is read from disk into memory and displayed on the monitor. At some point, all that data must be printed out. In 123, a printout of a spreadsheet is called a report. Draft quality reports can be printed quickly and easily, as you'll see now. When the printer is turned on, 123 assumes the print head is at the top of the page. With the printer power off, manually advance the paper so the printhead is at the perforation.
turn on the printer, and put it online. Libby will use print printer command on the budget spreadsheet. Type slash and two P's to select the main print menu. Then an R to select the range option. We want to print the active area of the spreadsheet. To specify this range quickly, type home, a period, the end key, home again, and press enter. Now type an A to get the align option. Press G for go, and press Q to quit the print menu. The report starts printing. When the printing is done, 123 doesn't advance the paper to the top of the next page. Use the print printer page command to advance the paper. Type slash and three P's, and the paper advances. If you need enhancements, such as headers and footers, 123 has other commands to make them. It's time to review the major points about filing and printing. 123 has three file types, as shown by the file extension. A file save command stores the current spreadsheet on the disk. The file retrieve command calls up a spreadsheet from the disk. A report is just a printout of a spreadsheet. Draft quality reports can be made quickly and easily with default settings. Business graphics help decision makers make sense out of volumes of numbers. It's easier to see an important trend on a graphic than it is to find it among lists of numbers. 123 can make both draft quality and final quality graphics. Draft quality means the graphics are quick on-screen displays. They're unlabeled and aren't saved or printed. Final quality graphics are meant for formal business presentations. They're labeled and are printed by the print graph program. Of course, a graph can be printed with the shift print screen keys but it won't have the quality needed for formal reports. 123 offers several types of graphs, such as line charts, bar charts, stacked bar charts, and pie charts. Libby will show you how to make a draft quality bar chart. Type slash, G, T, and B to select a bar graph. Then type A to enter the range to be plotted. We'll use cells B10 to B15 to show expenses. Press Enter. Finally, type V to view the graph. We get the bar chart of expense categories in the budget. It looks bare, but it's useful to get a quick look at trends. Press Enter to clear the graph, then Q to exit the graph menu. It's easy to add labels to our draft graphics. The keys to use are slash G, O, D and A. Type the range A10 to A15 and press enter. These cells have the labels. Type C to center the labels. Type Q twice to get the main graph menu and type V to view the graph. The labels in cells A10 to A15 were used to label corresponding bars from B10 to B15. Clear the graphic by pressing Enter. Then type Q to exit the graph menu. Titles and legends can be added with similar commands. Each type of chart requires a different command sequence, so consult your manual. Here's a very brief summary of business graphics. Both draft quality and final quality graphics can be made. The graph command is used to make them. 123 has several types of graphs. In the real world, spreadsheets are changed from time to time. A very common change is editing the numbers. Other changes include copying and deleting cells and formulas. 
Here's how to do some simple editing. To change a cell, just move the pointer to it. Type the new entry and press Enter. It's that simple. For the next few examples, cell protection has to be removed. Sometimes you may need to edit a formula without retyping the whole thing. To do so, move the pointer to the cell and press the F2 key. This puts you in the edit mode. The formula appears in the control panel. Move the cursor with the arrow keys. The delete key removes a single character. Type any new characters. Press enter when done and the cell is updated with the new formula. The copy command makes a duplicate of a range of cells. Libby has a demo for us. The copy command is slash C. A prompt appears for the range to be copied from. Column B extends from cell B4 to B19. Press Enter. Another prompt appears for the range to be copied to. Enter the starting cell, C4 in our case, and press Enter. Instantly, the copy appears in column C. The copy has all the numbers, labels, formulas, and formats of the original. There is one caution with the copy command. The contents of the cells in the two range are gone forever. The move command is an electronic cut and paste. As an example, Libby will move column C to column D. The command is slash M. A prompt appears to enter the range to be moved from. Column C extends from cell C4 to C19. Press Enter. Another prompt appears for the range to move to. The starting cell is D4. Then press Enter. Instantly, the column moves. Everything was moved, including numbers, labels, formulas, and formats. The same caution applies to the move command. The contents of the two range are gone forever. If you want to erase cell contents, use the range erase command. In this example, column D will be erased. The command is slash RE. A prompt appears for the range to be erased. That cell D4 to D19. Press enter and the column vanishes. Whenever formulas are copied or moved, cell addressing becomes a concern. That's because it affects formulas. For example, when Libby made a copy of column B in column C, the formula in cell C17 was changed to use cells in column C. This is called relative addressing. Cell addresses are changed automatically for the new location. Sometimes you may not want a cell address to change. Suppose we wanted to know the percentage of the total expenses for each expense item. The percentage formula for taxes would be cell C10 divided by the total in cell C17. And it might go into cell D10. When copied to cell D11, an error occurs. The copied formula is no longer valid. The divisor has been changed to C18 by the relative address mechanism. To prevent this, use absolute addressing for the total expenses formula. Edit the original formula to have a dollar sign in front of the row and column of the divisor. This time, the copied formula works correctly. The divisor didn't change because it's an absolute address. Here are the major points of editing. Cell contents can be changed by retyping or by using edit mode. 123 has commands to copy, move, and erase. Addresses in a formula will change when copied or moved unless they're absolute addresses. 
We'll stop to preview the next segment about complex spreadsheets. Pam and I will present the issues related to complex spreadsheets. We also present many of the techniques used to resolve those issues. The final subject has a detailed example of making a complex formula and shows how to document spreadsheets. Our demonstration spreadsheet is a tax estimator. It summarizes income and deductions. Let's begin our study of complex spreadsheets. Real-world spreadsheets are often large and complex to build. Of course, the workflow is still the same. But we have many new issues. For example, when sketching the model, several pages must be laid out. Moving around a large spreadsheet takes a little more work and you have to remember many cell addresses. Complex formulas frustrate many people. Last but not least, proper documentation must be made. Now for detailed descriptions of how to deal with these issues. Complex spreadsheets often use many printed pages. While sketching out the model, remember these guidelines. It's good practice to use the first page for operating instructions. Follow that with the data pages from the model. For example, Form 1040, page 1, would be first, with page 2 on the right, then Schedule A to the right of that, and so on. Use the last page for technical documentation. Also, make a page map showing the addresses of the top left and lower right cells of each page. Our tax estimator has a three-page layout according to these guidelines. The printed 123 page has 62 rows and 72 characters across. When you set the column widths, be sure they add up to 72 characters per page. Now we're ready to get a blank spreadsheet. Use the worksheet erase command. Caution! It's dangerous because it wipes out everything make sure you really need to use it. Type slash W, E, and Y. To set up the tax spreadsheet, set the default column width to 12. Also set the width of column G to 24. Enter the instruction page. Libby will continue entering instructions while I talk about scrolling. One problem in large spreadsheets is just plain moving around. When the pointer moves to a window edge, the window is scrolled one column or row at a time. It's great for moving to cells just beyond the edges, but slow for distant cells. A quicker way is scrolling one screen full at a time. When the control and right arrow keys are pressed at the same time, the window moves to the right one whole screen full. Pressing the control and left arrow keys together have the opposite effect. In the vertical direction, the page down and page up keys have corresponding actions. Libby has just finished page one and needs to get to page two. The control and right arrow keys move the window instantly. Now enter page two. Libby will continue entering page two while we go on to the next topic. Another problem of large spreadsheets is remembering cell addresses. Range names help solve that problem. A range is an abbreviation for a rectangular block of one or more cells. A descriptive name can be given to a range to help you remember what's in it. For example, 
the range name income might refer to cell H3, which contains total income. Use the range name create command to name a block of cells. Libby has two examples. Type slash R, N, and C. When prompted, type a name up to 15 characters long. Then type the range address at the prompt and press enter. The next cell name is adjust. Its address is H4. Range names can be used in place of cell addresses in formula and functions. The formula in cell H6 was automatically changed to use range names. It's more understandable. The best time to create range names is before entering formulas. Libby will continue entering range names and formatting cells. Here's what we covered in this subject. Complex spreadsheets often have several pages. Various scrolling methods are used to move around. Range names help you remember cell contents. In this last subject, we finish the discussion of complex spreadsheets. Complex formulas take more thought to build, so we'll go step by step. This is the most involved topic in the entire tape, but once you know it, you can build any kind of formula you want. Our example is the tax computation formula in cell H14. It's easiest to start by writing the formula in plain words. Using IRS publications, we found the formula for tax table X. In plain words, it reads as follows. The total tax equals a base tax plus the tax rate times the difference between the taxable income and the income limit. Three terms in this formula depend on tax bracket. They must be looked up in the tax table. Now we can choose which function to use. The function for looking up numbers in a table is called vertical lookup or V lookup for short. For our tax table, the first argument is the taxable income. The second is the range of the tax table. And the third argument is a column index. Here's how it would work to find the base tax. V lookup compares taxable income to the values in column 0. It chooses the cell which has a value less than or equal to taxable income. Then it uses the column index to look up the base tax from column 1 of the same row. The next step is to build the tax table into the spreadsheet. From the paper model, it starts at cell G24. To get there, just press page down and move the cell pointer. The income limits must be in column 0. To save time, skip showing the whole construction. We're almost done with the formula. Only two steps remain. Each term in the formula must be converted to a function, cell address, or range name. Here's the list of converted terms. The taxable income is represented by a range name. The base tax converts to the VLOOKUP function with a column index of 1. The tax rate converts to the same thing, except the column index is 2. 
the income limit is also the same except the column index is zero. Now let's bring it all together in the final step. The formula is built by substituting functions and addresses for the terms, as Libby will show us. Press the page up key to return to the top of page two and move the pointer to cell H14. Type the base tax function. a plus sign, and the tax rate function. Then type an asterisk, left parenthesis, and taxable income. Now for a minus sign and the income limit function. Then the closing right parenthesis, and finally press enter. The tax is computed and displayed. That's a lot to remember. So here's a recap of building complex formulas. Start by writing the formula in plain words. Choose the functions needed. Build any needed tables into the spreadsheet. Convert each term in the formula to a function or cell address. Finally, build the formula by substituting functions and cell addresses for the terms. Here's the completed page two, properly formatted. Professional programmers document their software. It helps them remember what the software does and how to use it. It's a good habit for you too. The instruction page is important documentation which you have to enter. In addition, 123 creates two sets of automatic documentation. The range name table command makes a list of range names in your spreadsheets. Libby has a demo. Press control and right arrow to get to page three. The command keys are slash R, N, and T. From our model, the table starts in cell L1. Press enter and the table appears instantly. The range name table should be made after formatting individual cells and before protecting cells. The second set of automatic documentation is the cell formula printout. It lists the contents of every occupied cell. In particular, it shows the formulas and is very useful for troubleshooting. To print the formulas, use the print printer options other command. Begin by typing slash p twice, then r. Enter the range by pressing home, period, and home again, and enter. Type o twice and c. Wait for the options menu to reappear. Type o, f, and Q. 
followed by A, G, and another Q. The cell formula printout can be made after printing the spreadsheet. There is one caution when using this procedure. The As Displayed option has to be reselected before printing another report. To reselect it, type slash P twice, then O twice, and an A. Wait for the Options menu to reappear and type Q twice. To briefly summarize, complex formulas are built in a step-by-step -step manner. Documentation helps you remember what a spreadsheet does and how to use it. You have to make the instruction page, but 123 creates other documentation. When you're ready to quit 123, first save the current spreadsheet, then type slash and Q. Another prompt appears to verify the quit command. Type Y. The DOS prompt should appear. If you have a dual floppy system in version 3.2 or later of MS-DOS, you'll be prompted to insert the MS-DOS disk in drive A. After doing so, press any key and the A prompt will appear. Well, that wraps it up. You now know how to use 123 productively. The two most important topics are spreadsheet workflow and building complex formulas. Now that you understand them, you can build any kind of spreadsheet you want. Word processing software is a key tool in the electronic office. It saves you time because it automates drafting, revising, and printing of documents. WordPerfect is one of the best-selling software packages. It has about 30% of the word processing market. Our goal is to give you a working knowledge of WordPerfect so you can use it for everyday documents. We've condensed about half your software manual into this tape. After viewing it, your manual will be much easier to follow. We don't cover every nut and bolt. Instead, we'll present the features you need to be productive quickly. The material in this tape is divided into three major segments. The first segment shows how to prepare the software. In the second segment, we describe how to draft documents with WordPerfect. Finally, the techniques for revising and editing are presented. The subjects of page design, style, and mail merge will be covered in our advanced tape on WordPerfect. Our computer system is a PCXT compatible with dual floppy disk drives, a hard disk drive, and a printer. Its operating system is MS-DOS version 3.3. We assume you know how to use DOS. My job is explaining the concepts and features of WordPerfect. And my job is demonstrating the commands and procedures. I suggest you first view this tape in its entirety, then review each subject and try the demonstrations. Together, Diane and I will provide you computer literacy in an easy-to-learn way. Our viewers are ready, Ed, so let's get started. We have several items of preparation to do before we can print documents. Make sure you have the required hardware and software. Your software manual should list these. In particular, 384 k bytes of memory are required to run the program. Also, a graphics card is needed to see text enhancement and review documents. The software is shipped on several master disks. These include the WordPerfect program disk 1 and 2. Be sure to apply right protect tabs over the square notches of the masters. The software configuration will depend on what type of disk your system has. For a hard disk system, the C drive holds the program and documents in a subdirectory of the root directory. 
For a dual floppy disk system, the A drive is used for the program disk and the B drive is used for a document disk. The B drive is also used for the spell checker and thesaurus. The two major items of preparation are installing and starting the software. For hard disk systems, use the following installation procedures. Start your computer, enter the date and the time, and get the C prompt. Make a subdirectory with the name WP. Then change to that subdirectory. Insert the WordPerfect One Master Disk into Drive A. Type copy, a space, then A, colon, asterisk, dot, asterisk, another space, C, colon, backslash, WP, and press Enter. This copies the files from the master into the subdirectory. Also, copy the WordPerfect2 master and the Speller and Thesaurus masters into the subdirectory. Then, make working copies of the remaining master disks as follows. Change the default drive to A. Insert one of the remaining masters into drive A. Use the disk copy command with the A drive as the source and the B drive as the destination. Then follow the directions on the screen. Be sure to label the working copy when done. Repeat the copy operation for each remaining master disk. Now get the C prompt again. The DOS file config.sys has to be changed to handle WordPerfect's disk usage. Console input is the quickest way to change it. Type copy, a space, and C colon backslash config dot sys plus con. Then type another space and repeat the full directory and file name. And finally, press enter. Wait until the word con appears and press enter again. Now type the line files equals 20 and enter. This sets the number of files which can be open. Also type buffers equals 20 and press enter. This will speed up disk operations. To terminate input, press the control and Z keys at the same time followed by the enter key. The DOS prompt will reappear and the updated file will be in the root directory. The updates won't have any effect until the computer is restarted. Make sure the A drive is empty. Restart the computer by pressing Control, Alt, and Delete at the same time. Re-enter the date and the time. It's time to start the software. Change to the WordPerfect subdirectory with the same command as before. Type WP and press Enter. For dual floppy systems, we need to make working copies of all master disks 
and change the config.sys file. Put the MS-DOS disk into drive A. Start the computer and enter the date and the time and get the A prompt. Once again, use the disk copy command with A and B as the source and destination, respectively. Insert the WordPerfect One Master into Drive A and a blank disk into B. Press enter to start the copy. Label the working copy when it's done. Repeat the disk copy and labeling for all the remaining master disks. The steps to change config.sys are almost the same as before. Return the DOS working copy to drive A. Type copy. a space, a colon, backslash, config, a dot, sys, plus, con. Type another space and repeat the directory and file name. At last, press enter and wait for the word con and press enter a second time. Enter the line file equals 20. Also enter the line buffers equals 20. Press Ctrl and Z at the same time and enter. The updated file will be on the DOS working copy. The WordPerfect startup procedure for a dual floppy system has some extra steps. Restart the computer by pressing Ctrl, Alt, and Delete at the same time. and enter the date and time. That restart was needed so that updates of config.sys will take effect. Replace the DOS disk in drive A with the WordPerfect One working copy. Also, put a formatted document disk in B. Type B colon and enter to change the default drive to B. Type A colon WP and press enter. This starts WordPerfect. The title screen appears with the prompt to replace the disk in drive A. Insert the WordPerfect 2 working copy into drive A. This disk must remain in A while using WordPerfect. Press any key and the blank editing screen soon appears ready for use. Place the keyboard template over the function keys. The blinking rectangle is the cursor. It's used for text entry and editing. The edit screen has a status line to show document related items. At this point, we must choose default settings to customize WordPerfect. After you start WordPerfect, the first time, be sure to define and select the printer. Defining the printer tells WordPerfect what kind of printer is connected to the computer. Selecting a printer enables it for use. Press Shift and F7 at the same time to get the main print menu. Then press F for the select printer screen. 
Here is the list of printers currently defined. Obviously, you must add your printer to the list. Type the number 2 for additional printer names. An error message should appear because the printer files are not present. Insert the printer one working copy in a disk drive. And type to the disk drive name and enter. When the additional printer names appear, examine them to find yours. If your printer is not on the list, Replace the printer 1 copy with another printer disk. Our printer name is on the printer 3 disk. Again, type 2, the disk drive name, and enter. Move the highlight with the arrow keys then type the number 1 and press enter. WordPerfect stores information about the printer in a file in the default directory. It also displays suggestions for that printer. After 20 seconds or so, press the exit key, F7, and the printer settings are shown. Accept them by pressing Enter. The Select Printer screen reappears with the newly defined printer in the list. Make sure the highlight is on your printer name and press Enter twice. The printer is now selected. Printer definition and selection only need to be done when you add or change printers or change printer port. The remaining default settings are selected from the Setup menu. Press Shift and F1 at the same time to get the main setup menu. The video display type must be set correctly. Press 3 to get the screen display options. The graphic screen option should match the video display hardware for your system. If not, press 5 to get a list of video display choices. Move the highlight with the arrow keys to the correct choice for your system. Press Enter to select it. Then press the Enter key again to return to the main setup menu. The units of measurement should be changed to lines and columns if you have a dot matrix or letter quality printer. Press 8 for the units of measurement options. Type the number 1 and a U, then type 2 and the letter U. Of course, the Enter key returns us to the main setup menu. The next default is the location for the auxiliary files for the speller and thesaurus. Type 7 to get the location options and 4 for the speller directory. For hard disk systems, type the path name C colon backslash WP and press enter. For dual floppy disk systems, type the path name B colon and press enter. Now press 8 for the thesaurus location. For hard disk systems, use the same path name as before. For dual floppy disk systems, type the B drive path name again. Pr press F7 to exit the setup menu and restore the editing screen. The settings remain in effect until you change them again with the setup menu. To cancel a function key command or back out of a menu, press the F1 key. That finishes preparation. We're ready to write documents. At this point, we'll stop to preview the next segment about creating a draft document. You'll learn how to enter text to move the cursor. Following that, we explain filing operations and how to print your document. Let's begin our study of making draft documents.
In this subject, we present the fundamentals of creating a document. As soon as the Word Perfect Edit screen appears, it's ready to accept text. To create a new document, just start typing, and the characters appear at the cursor position. It's that simple. Start a new line by pressing Enter and continue typing. For a blank line, press enter a second time after ending the line. The inside address and salutation are typed the same way. Long lines of text are handled differently. As the text reaches the right margin, WordPerfect starts a new line automatically. This is called word wrap. So for long sentences and paragraphs, you just keep typing and let WordPerfect handle the right margin. Press Enter key to end a paragraph and start a new line. Of course, press Enter again for a blank line. To repeat a character, hold down its key and the character will be typed until the key is released. Holding down a non-printing key has the same action. For instance, Backspace will erase the characters until it's released. If the enter key is held down, blank lines appear until the key is released. When the edit screen gets full, the top lines disappear and the remaining lines are moved up. This is called scrolling because it's similar to the movement of a scroll of paper past a window. Now, we'll look at more efficient ways to move the cursor. The numeric keypad on the right side of the keyboard contains several keys which are used to move the cursor. The down arrow key moves the cursor down one line, while the up arrow key moves it up one line. The right arrow key moves the cursor one character to the right, and the left arrow key does the opposite. Press the end key to move the cursor to the end of a line. Press home, followed by the left arrow to move the cursor to the beginning of the line. Press home, followed by the up arrow, to move it to the top of the edit screen. If you press home, followed by the down arrow, the cursor moves to the bottom. Manual scrolling is another form of cursor control. Use it to move the edit screen and see different parts of the document. Here are some scrolling controls. The page up key scrolls the edit screen upward one screen full of text. The page down key does the same thing in the opposite direction. Press home twice followed by up arrow to scroll all the way to the start of the document. Correspondingly, pressing home twice, then the down arrow key scrolls to the end of the document. Use cursor control to add text anywhere in the document. Just move the cursor to where you want the text and begin typing. Here's an example. Move the cursor between two paragraphs and press enter to start a new paragraph. Add the new text.
When the paragraph is done, press Enter to end the paragraph and insert a blank line. Diane will type some extra text for demonstrations later on. There are shortcuts to speed up cursor movement. Pressing Control and the right arrow at the same time moves the cursor one word to the right. Of course, Control and the left arrow do the same thing towards the left. The Escape key is used to repeat an operation. For example, press Escape, then the right arrow, and the cursor moves eight characters to the right. Pressing Escape, then the F arrow moves the cursor eight lines up. We are finished with this subject, and it's time to move on. Now, we present the commands used to file and print documents. The two basic filing operations are saving and retrieving. The save command stores a copy of the document on the disk. The document remains on screen for additional work. Simply press the F10 key, and a file name prompt appears on the status line. This prompt appears the first time you save a document. Type the complete file name, including an extension, and press Enter. The document is saved into the default directory. Wait for the file name to appear on the left side of the status line. Then continue working on the document. Of course, a WordPerfect file name must follow DOS rules. A maximum of eight characters for the name, plus a maximum of three characters for the extension. It's also a good idea to have a consistent set of extensions. Letters could have an extension of L-E-T, and so on. WordPerfect has certain reserved file extensions. Always avoid using them for your documents. Veteran users save their work every 15 minutes or so in case of power failure. To save the same document again, press F10 and enter. A prompt to replace the previous copy appears on the status line. Press Y and the save commences. When you're done working on a document, a similar procedure is used to save it and clear the screen. Press the F7 key to exit the document. A file save prompt appears. Type Y, Enter, and Y if you've made changes since the last save. Another prompt appears to exit WordPerfect. Press N to stay in WordPerfect and clear the screen. You're ready to start a new document. The list file command can be used to retrieve a document from the disk. Diane will demonstrate the easy way to retrieve the document just saved. Press the F5 or List Files key, press Enter, and the screen is filled with file names from the current directory. Use the arrow keys to move the highlight to the file you want. In this case, it's short.let. Press the number 1 to start the retrieve. The document is read from disk into memory and displayed on the monitor. There is a separate retrieve command, but it requires you to type the complete file name. The list files command is easier to use because you can see all the file names at a glance. The list files command also has options to do the file management functions you ordinarily do in MS-DOS. At some point, the draft document should be printed. WordPerfect has useful and productive features for printing. The print protection features make it almost impossible for printing problems to damage your document. The document to be printed is copied into a temporary file on disk. Printing is done from the temporary file so any problems don't affect the original. The temporary file is automatically erased when printing is done. Before you start printing, load the paper properly. When the printer is turned on, WordPerfect assumes the print head is at the top of the page. Turn on the printer and put it online.
Diane will show us how to print a document that's on the screen. Press Shift and F7 at the same time to get the print menu. Type the number 1 to print the full document. The document starts printing shortly after. While the copy is being printed, you can continue working on the original. This is better than waiting for a long document to finish printing before continuing work. It's also possible to print a document directly from disk without retrieving it to the screen. The easiest way of doing it involves the list files command. Press F5 and enter to get a list of file names in the current directory. Use the arrow keys to move the highlight to the file name short.let. Press the number 4 and enter. The document starts printing. Press F7 to return to the editing screen. After starting to print from disk, you can continue working on the document already on the screen. There is a separate command in the print menu to print from disk, but it requires the complete file name. The list files command is easier to use because it shows the file names. It isn't necessary to save every document before printing, otherwise your work disk will become cluttered. For documents of short-term value, print them from the screen. Then, use the exit key to clear the screen and start a new document. It's time to review the major points about filing and printing. The save command stores a document on the disk. The retrieve command calls up a document from the disk. WordPerfect has commands for doing both screen prints and disk prints. Once again, we'll stop to preview the next segment. This one is about revising and editing documents. WordPerfect has several commands to edit text. They include delete, move, and copy. Another feature is the block command. It lets you manipulate large segments of text very easily. Of course, a word processor also has commands to format the text. They control its appearance on the printed page. Each of these subjects will be explained in detail, so let's get going. The greatest benefit of a word processor is the ability to revise a document without retyping the entire thing. Editing actions such as deleting text and moving text only take a few keystrokes. In this subject, you'll master the commands used most often for editing. Deleting text is one of the most basic functions in a word processor. We've already seen how the backspace key erases characters. Another way to delete single characters is the delete key. Just move the cursor to the character to be deleted and press the delete key. The character disappears and the remaining text fills the gap. To delete a word, press control and backspace at the same time. The word at the cursor vanishes and the remaining text is reformatted. Larger segments of text can also be deleted with a few keystrokes. Diane will show us how to delete a sentence. Move the cursor to any place in the sentence to be deleted. Press Ctrl and F4 at the same time. A segment size menu appears in the status line. Press the number 1 to select the sentence. Another menu appears showing editing actions. Press 3 and the highlighted text vanishes. Notice that the size menu also has paragraphs and pages, so you can delete these segment sizes too. WordPerfect has a very handy feature called the undelete command. It's a safety mechanism which restores accidental deletions. For example, to restore the sentence, just delete it. Start by pressing the F1 key to get the undeleted menu. The deleted sentence temporarily appears at the cursor location. Press 1 
and the sentence is restored to the document. As extra protection, WordPerfect saves the last three deletions. Diane will restore the word deleted a while ago. Move the cursor back to the place where the word was. Press F1 followed by 2 to get the second previous deletion on the screen. Press 1 and the word is restored to the document. The move command is the electronic equivalent of cut and paste. It's nothing more than deleting text from one place and inserting it in another. Here's a demo of moving an entire sentence. Put the cursor any place in the sentence to be moved. Press Control and F4 at the same time to get the Move menu. The Segment Size menu appears again. This time, press 1 for the Move option and the sentence vanishes. A prompt appears to relocate the cursor and press enter. When you do, the sentence appears at the new location. Almost the same procedure is used to copy text. Move the cursor any place in the text to be copied. For example, we'll use this sentence. Once again, press Control and F4 to get the move menu. Now press the number 1 to select the sentence. In the editing menu, press 2 to make a copy of the selection. Note that the original selection remains intact. Once again, a prompt appears to relocate the cursor and press enter. When you do so, the copy appears at the new location. Sentences, paragraphs, and pages can be copied with these simple procedures. Now, for a quick recap of basic editing. Edit commands are used to revise a document. The most commonly used edit commands are delete, move, and copy. Use the undelete command to restore accidental deletions. Sometimes you'll need to work on a segment of text which spans several words, sentences, or paragraphs. For instance, you may need to move a group of paragraphs to another place in the document. They can be moved one at a time, but that's time consuming. A more efficient way is the block command. The paragraphs can be selected with the block command and then moved in a single operation. A block is simply a large segment of text which can be manipulated in a single operation. Here's an example of a block delete. Two sentences will be deleted. The first step is selecting the text block. Move the cursor to the beginning of the sentences. Press Alt and the F4 key at the same time to activate the block command. A notice appears in the status line that the block command is active. Move the cursor to the end of the second sentence with the arrow keys. As the cursor moves, the text between its original position and current position is highlighted. The text block is now completely selected. The second step is typing the command which works on the block. In our case, that's the delete command. Press the delete key and a confirmation prompt appears. This prevents accidental deletions. Type a Y to proceed with the deletion. The block vanishes. Not very difficult. A text block can range in size from one character to several pages. The block command is always used with another command. It makes the text segment ready for the second command. So, for any block operation, first, select the text with the block command, then type the command which works on the block. In this demonstration, two paragraphs will be moved. Move the cursor to the beginning of the paragraph. Press the Alt-F4 key combination for the block command. 
Move the cursor to the end of the paragraphs to completely select them. Use the Control and F4 key combination to invoke the Move menu. Type the number 1 to indicate the segment size is a block. Press 1 again for the Move option and the block vanishes. A prompt appears to relocate the cursor and press Enter. Move the cursor down and press Enter. The block appears at the new location. Obviously, the block command is a powerful editing tool. Here are some other uses for it. You can reorganize a document with block moves. To print only a part of a document, use the block command before the print command. Make large scale format changes by formatting blocks. The block command can be used with most other commands. Check the manual for a complete list. I have two final tips for using the block command. If you select a block and decide to cancel it, just press Alt and F4 a second time instead of typing another command. The end delete key also works with blocks. Move the cursor to the block's former location. The F1 or cancel key gets the end delete menu. The deleted block temporarily appears on the screen at the cursor location. Press 1 and the block is restored. Be sure to remember the following key points about block operations. The subject of formatting involves the placement and appearance of text on the printed page. WordPerfect has a wealth of format options. We'll show you the ones most commonly used. Before doing so, we need to discuss WordPerfect's default page layout. The default page size is 8.5 inches wide by 11 inches long. The default margin is 1 inch on all four sides. Your text will be printed in the rectangular area defined by these defaults. These defaults can be changed, but they are acceptable for ordinary word processing. Paragraph alignment is the horizontal placement of text between the left and right margins. For example, right justified text is aligned on both edges. It's meant for formal documents. To get right justification, start by moving the cursor to the beginning of the document. Press the Shift and F8 keys at the same time to get the format menu. Type a 1 for the line option, then type a 3 for the justification option. Type a Y to select right justification. Finally, press F7 to exit the menu and return to the editing screen. The editing screen doesn't show right justified text due to technical limitations, so use the view command. Press shift and F7 together to get the print menu. Then type a 6 for the view command and a 1 for 100% magnification. A picture of how the printed page will look appears. The text on both sides will have a smooth edge from justification. When the right justification is turned off, the text has a ragged right edge. This is suitable for informal documents. Here are two demonstrations of another alignment option, centered text. To center a single line, first move the cursor to the start of the line. Press Shift and F6 keys down at the same time. Then press the down arrow. The line is centered. To center a block of text, such as a list, first select it with the block command, Alt-F4. Press the Shift and F6 keys. 
A prompt appears for confirmation. Type a Y and the block is centered. Paragraph indentation options allow text to be indented without changing the margins. To indent a single paragraph, move the cursor to the first character of the paragraph. Then press F4, followed by the down arrow. The left edge of the paragraph is indented one tab stop. Two steps are needed to format a hanging paragraph. Indent it with the F4 and down arrow keys as we just saw. Move the cursor to the start of the paragraph. Then use the margin release by pressing the shift and tab keys at the same time. The first line is outdented to the normal margin. Text enhancement refers to changing the appearance of the characters. Attributes such as font style and font size can be changed. To illustrate, I'll select this paragraph with the block command and then press the F8 key to underline it. Enhancing the text with boldface is done in the same way using the F6 key. Boldfacing and underline are done so often function keys are reserved for them. For other enhancements, the font menu must be used as we'll see now. Select a word with the block command and press Control and F8 at the same time. The font menu appears in the status line. Type 2 for the appearance submenu. Type the number of the enhancements you want. For italics, I'll type 4. Depending on your monitor's capabilities, you may have to use the View command to see enhancements. Press Shift and F7 at the same time. Type a 6 for the view command. Note that 100% magnification remains in effect from the last time. There's the word Diane just rendered in italics. Press F7 to return to the editing screen. Anytime you format or enhance text, WordPerfect puts special hidden codes in the document. For instance, when this word was italicized, the codes for italic font were inserted before and after it. These codes aren't shown on the normal editing screen. In order to remove certain formats and enhancements, you have to delete their hidden codes with the reveal codes command. Press Alt and F3 at the same time and the screen is split into two windows. The top has the ordinary text and the bottom shows the text plus hidden codes in square brackets. Move the cursor in the lower window to either hidden code for the italicized word. Press the delete key and both hidden codes for the word are removed. When done, press Alt and F3 again to restore the normal editing screen. The underlining has been restored to the formerly italicized word. There are several things to remember about formatting. Format commands control the placement and appearance of text. This includes paragraph alignment, indentation, and text enhancements. WordPerfect's default page layout can be used for ordinary documents. In order to remove certain formats and enhancements, delete their hidden codes. When you're ready to quit WordPerfect, press the exit key. Press Y, Enter, and Y to save the document if changes were made since the last save. 
A prompt appears to exit WordPerfect. Press Y. The doc prompt will reappear. That wraps it up. You now know enough to use WordPerfect productively. With this knowledge, you can write everyday documents on your computer. If you're looking for our advanced tape on WordPerfect, which will explain page design, styles, mail merge, and macros, 